I'm Jim Benny, and I'm at Northeastern University, one of the four, now five, universities that are um, members of, of the CHOT um, Center for Health Organization Transformation. My hope is to give you um, a fairly broad overview of a number of things we've been doing in predictive modeling so that we can get some feedback as to where this research should go next. So applications, I'll step through these one at a time and just give a little sense for the general nature of the problem, uh, the approach we've taken, and where we are so far. Um, so let me just jump to the first application. The, the general concept here on the left-hand side and some schematics on the right-hand side, but can we predict on arrival to the ED if a patient's going to eventually need an inpatient bed? And then if we can predict at the individual patient level, as patients start to arrive to the ED and the room becomes, the waiting room becomes more and more crowded, if we could aggregate those probabilities at the patient level across uh, the N patients currently in the ED, could we uh, do that in a way where we know something about the, the mean, the standard deviation, and for that matter, the probability distribution of the number of patients that eventually will need a bed? Um, so in the upper right-hand corner, you, you see two um, flow graphs, uh, and the top one being sort of this classic process where after your uh, course of treatment in the ED, a decision's made, and there's a request for a bed that's made, and then a bed's available or not, and the patient boards or doesn't, and there's a, a little bit of a delay. So if we knew with some probability if, if I, as a patient, were likely to need a bed earlier in my ED length of stay, that information may or may not be useful to a bed manager to start to make beds available and... Um, and, and start to think about flow. I mean, so that's that's the real general idea. So this work's been published in uh, two places, the uh, Academic Emergency Medicine, two papers in healthcare management science. So this other area that um, fairly new problem we've been working on, but it's basically upstream downstream flow. And so the PACU being full is leading to upstream problems in terms of needing to delay uh, surgery starts or uh, for elective surgery, scheduling them another day. The approach here is um, basically developing a simulation of the predicted number of people in the upstream process and in the downstream process by time of day, and then in some way react to that. <clears throat> Either prepare for it, how else are we gonna recover these patients, and stick to the plan or modify the plan. Say we've got a prototype tool under development. And so we think that this is a complementary tool that would be very useful um, just to give a heads up as to how bad tomorrow is gonna be and, and maybe do something about it. Both of these first two problems naturally extend to, what about a dashboard for my whole facility? So could I predict bed census three weeks out across the whole facility. Uh, and so that's what this other uh, project has been working on. And methodologically, it's a, it's a lot more advanced, but, but, but the concept is sort of a simple one, um, which is we know our known work. We know what's scheduled over the next several days. Some of the schedule hasn't filled in yet, but, but we know what's scheduled. Uh, we know what's also unscheduled in a likely way. Like, it, one can, there is predictability around urgent emergent um, with some error band, obviously. But if you look at historical data, one can predict what's coming in through the ED. So if you take all that information, which is known, knowable, or discoverable, and, and propagate that forward, one can develop a long term forecast, which is what you see in the lower right hand corner this green funnel graph. In terms of where we are in, in the work right now, we've identified a number of test beds, actually now more than three. We're in the process of getting or have data, historical data from these systems. And what we're doing is retrospectively validating. So dial back the clock. We know what census actually worked out to be over the last couple of years. 
can we go back 400 days and then pretend we're running prospectively? And can we accurately predict the past? Let me switch gears real quickly and talk about um, primarily this fourth application, maybe a little bit the fifth application. Here's the general context um, with language around referrals. And so our, our test bed to date has been um, neurology subspecialty referrals. So um, in some other part of the care system, uh, reading this flow chart left to right, um, a primary care provider or somebody indicates a need for a referral to a subspecialist. <clears throat> then there's the black box that decides, um, does this individual really need a face-to-face -face referral on the bottom part of this flow, uh, which costs a fair amount of money, often retrospectively wasn't needed, um, and creates an access problem. Um, so black box, should this patient go to referral, or could this patient be handled in some other way? So we've been um, working with real data and exploring the accuracy of all, <clears throat> all the common predictive models one could um, list out. Um, logistic regression, support vectors, um, classification trees, ensemble methods, you know, combining the best of the best, uh, and, and others. And we're getting pretty good accuracy. Here are preliminary results to date working in one subspecialty in neurology, taking data from one recent month and doing this offline testing, where essentially, um, retrospectively, uh, a panel, um, not quite that formal, of, of clinicians looked back on a number of patients and, and decided via quasi-consensus did this patient actually need a face-to-face, -face or could they have been um, as well served with a curbside consult? And then looking at what our tool would have recommended <clears throat> versus them as the gold standard. And that's what you see this table in the upper right-hand corner, comparing the tool to, let's call it truth, and how patients would have flowed through the flow path in the previous slide, and what the net cost and cost savings would have been if all of these patients hadn't gotten face to face. In the lower left hand corner, you can see sort of the bullet summary in terms of about a 25% reduction in face to face consults. Of those patients that flowed hypothetically to face to face, about in terms of we're talking about sensitivity and specificity now, right? 3%. Um, unnecessary, but that's better than 26% um, unnecessary. Um, so that equates to better access and faster, fewer days till third next available or days until I can see face-to-face -face when I need it, a specialist, and an extraordinary amount of potential savings. Um, let me talk briefly about no-shows, um, only because it, it has predictive modeling in it from a process improvement perspective, what can we do to reduce the no-show rate? But you're always going to have some no-show rate, so can we predict that? And if you can predict that, um, how do you do differently but analogous to the airlines and hotels and optimally overbook? So what's the ballpark of how much we should overbook by using simulation or some other rule base or common sense or, or algorithm to figure out where in the day to overbook? And then putting this into practice through sort of a series of incremental scale-up tests. There are opportunities um, by predicting no-shows to use some of the retrospectively unused appointment slots um, to increase revenue, uh, therefore, and to improve appointment access because you're working down the queue. Just to recap, um, we've done this preliminary work in really these four slash five application areas. And um, in our view, um, the methods seem very approachable and seem to have face validity uh, and seem to um, have predictive power. We really want to test this stuff in practice, and larger samples are better than smaller samples. Um, so we've got great partners, 
and we'd love to have a few more um, systems that want to test any of these methods um, so that we can evaluate them for generalizability. We can serve the mission of CHOT, which is really to do cross-system collaboration and to contribute to the broader body of knowledge that, that health systems everywhere can benefit from.